I'd like to thank Dorothy for inviting me to this. Apart from anything else, um, I'd actually already bought the book and it was in my interesting things to read pile. You know the thing that mine's always enormous and I often don't get round to reading them. <laughs> but being invited to come along and be a discussant, I now have read the book, all of it. So, uh, and I enjoyed it very much. So I'm grateful to her for suggesting that and uh, I, I um, think it's an excellent book. Uh, in order to keep within the 10 minutes, and I think we need to do that in order that there's some chance to debate, I, I'm going to talk about three strengths of the book from my perspective and uh, three what we call in management schools challenges. You're not allowed to say uh, weaknesses, it's a mistake. Okay. <laughs> Issues, etc. Okay, so three strengths. Um, let me start off with the first strength is the focus on the economically poor. Um, I was in... Uh, Kenya a long, long time ago, at a time when the, um, uh, I was working there, the informal sector was discovered. And economists discovered remarkably that these poor people actually did things, you know, they repaired cars, they engaged in other economically active uh, uh, pursuits, it has to be said, including crime and prostitution as well, but there we go. Uh, in other words, a whole range of economic pursuits were, were there. And what always struck me and strikes me about the economically poor is how resourceful they generally are, how entrepreneurial they are, how keen they are to use what limited resources they have to lead a decent life. Particularly topical, I think, in the context of the current UK uh, government's attempt to label the uh, <laughs> poor as idle shirkers, in the main, or at least some of them. Um, so I welcome very much the focus of the book which presents the people as being resourceful, interesting, committed, etc. I sometimes summarise this by saying it's bad enough being poor without being patronised as well. So I don't think the book does that. I think it displays the character, the resources, the vigour, etc. of the economically poor. And I, I think that was, for me, an excellent part of, of the book. Um, of course, Dorothea's book draws extensively from um, Sen's... Um, capability approach, and I think uses it very well. Sen has been criticised, as some of you will know, for being better at saying what, it, what we would like to deliver to people, choice, capability to live, the, and not how you go about doing it. Uh, a particular irony, bearing in mind he's an Indian writer, an Indian origin writer, and India is particularly, I, I work a lot in India, India is particularly good at having views about what you wish to do and not putting in place mechanisms that enable the economically poor to actually um, benefit from that. So that the, um, I think one of the things that Dorothea's book does is it does augment Sen's analysis with concepts such as structure and agency and tries to articulate some of the reasons why it can be quite difficult for people to uh, realise those capabilities. If you like, it puts a more political dimension onto uh, the capability approach. Others have also done that, but I think I liked the fact that the book picks up on certain elements that are not there in some of the other criticisms. One, one I would mention would be psychological resources. I think that's very well done in the book and very interesting, and I think we need to develop that a little bit more. So what I'm saying is the capability approach itself is of interest to me and others, uh, and um, I think that, that Dorothea's approach to it does actually augment the... And, and to be fair to Sen, as I understand it, he would be quite positive about that. In other words, he doesn't see it as the last word. He sees it more as, 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 as a, an approach, a meta-theory, if you want, which others can develop, and I think Dorothea's book does that well. And the third strength that I would mention is that... Um, ICTs are often, and this is where the ICT dimension comes in, ICTs are often treated in a very individualistic or narrow way. In other words, here we've done this little bit of software or whatever and it's being used for this particular health project or whatever. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se. We do need to, you know, do things like that. But I think the book goes quite a way beyond that to try to articulate how ICTs are... Um, embedded in a whole range of aspects of the framework and, and thus we need to consider them in a, in a more holistic way and I think the, the framework does that, uh, uh, moves us in that direction. I've got a comment about that in a moment on, in terms of the challenges. So uh, 
excellent focus on the poor, an augmentation of the capability analysis and a more holistic approach to the role of ICTs. The three challenges I've got, actually, um, as I was listening to Dorothy, I was thinking, well, she's fully aware of these challenges, so I'm not saying I don't think anything that um, uh, she wouldn't already uh, know about, but I did think it might be interesting to see what they are from my point of view, if nothing else, uh, in, in order to stimulate discussion. I still struggle with this individual and collective choice. In other words, the book uh, emphasises individual choice, and it's very good on that, and it shows how individuals navigate their lives in a sensible and thoughtful way to try to uh, uh, lead better lives uh, uh, through that process, and I think that's well done. And, of course, we then get a series of individuals. Now, in some sort of ideal world, we would then aggregate those individuals to get together in some collective mode so that they then work to create a context within which those individual choices were maximised. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And Chile Compra is a brilliant illustration of it. The, the people in Santiago are supposed to be representing the collective choice of the people in the country, but they implement it in a way that actually creates enormous difficulties for these relatively poor entrepreneurs to get engaged, more difficult than it was in the, prior to the existence of that system. Therefore, we've got to articulate what are the limitations in, in these connectivities between uh, individual choice and collective choice. And I think that pushes in a very strongly political way. Because what it's saying is that the decision makers in Santiago or elsewhere, and it's not just Chile, of course, about this, need to be forced in some sort of senses to um, take seriously the views of people out in the more peripheral areas. Um, again, many years ago in India, the head of the National Informatics Centre, which at that time was responsible for all computerization within the context of India, said to me, why do you go out to the villages, Jeff? I don't understand this at all. He said, we know everything that there is to know here in Delhi. You don't need to go and talk to these people. And that attitude is still quite prevalent in, in many countries of the world, the arrogance, if you want to put it that way, of those in the centre. So I think that needs to be developed, that, that political strand of that disconnect, if you want, between the individual and the collective. Okay. A second challenge I think there is for, for the sort of approach that Dorothea is articulating is I was struck by the fact that it was quite resource intensive. It was resource intensive because it involved Dorothea doing a lot of work. And that's great, <laughs> and we're all benefiting <laughs> from that. What a lazy <laughs> But I'm a bit worried about operationalising it. I'm a bit worried about, you know, development agencies, as we all know, like neat little projects that have an outcome that you can specify up front and say three years down the road we're going to get these sorts of benefits. I think to sort of shift it the other way around to a strongly, um, a strongly uh, local focus of what is desirable, what is, you know, a bottom-up approach to that would require a complete shift in many ways, a, r a really major shift in emphasis as to where resources are put. Because to do that, you've got to take seriously trying to get access to those views in the same way as Dorothea has done in her work. And I think it's admirable in the way she's done it, but I think it's very difficult to operationalise that within a climate or context where development is often... S development aid is often seen as being something, you know, deliverables that you have to deliver or at least pretend that you've delivered at the end of the day because that's the only way in which you might get some repeat funding to do something else. So I'm not only do we need to get a shift in attitude amongst the political elites in places like uh, Chile and others, we also need to get a change in attitude in the aid agencies that operate from places like here. One minute, right. My last point... <laughs> It's, it's a slightly surprising one that in the sense that ICTs is, is ostensibly the focus of the book, but in a sense they seem to disappear slightly in the actual large diagram that you have there. They, they sort of, there in the structure, I think that's the only explicit mention, and yet they are clearly deeply involved in all the other aspects, resources, for example, even the choice itself, etc. So... I, there would seem a bit of a disconnect between the 
the emphasis on ICTs as being, and, and a lot of the book, rightly so, is not about ICT. So I think there's still a further challenge to articulate exactly how the ICTs are implicated in your uh, excellent framework that you've developed. But I want to end on a positive note. I've often argued that this the field of ICT for D, whilst I'm not, I hasten to add, anti-practice, I still think is under-theorised. And I very much welcome uh, Dorothea's contribution because I think it's a very substantial attempt at theorising and I think she's to be congratulated on it. So thanks very much. Thank you.